So I've been doing diversity and inclusion work my whole life. I went to my first civil rights meetings when I was a teenager. I've been doing this professionally now for, for almost 30 years. And the question I want to start us with is how successful are we? I think it's a legitimate question to ask, particularly when we look at the last 10 to 15 years when we've spent more money, put more energy, more resources in diversity and inclusion than ever before in our history. More books written on diversity, more people going into diversity trainings, more chief diversity officers hired, more staff of diversity, more Oprah shows about diversity. You, know, you name it, it's become mainstream. And yet when we look to pick up on what Tyrone was saying, when we look at it, what we see is women's salary is still only about 81% of men's. When we look at leadership, less than 5% of, of Fortune 1000 companies, less than 5% of those CEOs are women, less than 5% people of color. When we look at unemployment, we know that unemployment rates show huge disparities between between various different racial, cultural, and ethnic groups in our society, and women. When we look at health care, we know that health disparities, even though our general health care has improved, that health disparities in our country today among people of color, particularly African Americans, Latinos, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender folks, as well as people with disabilities, massive disparities. We know where housing is concerned. Again, massive disparities in who has access to housing. And where incarceration is concerned, African Americans are incarcerated as much as eight times more than Caucasians. Now, I could go on and on. We could also talk about the whole immigration resistance that we're seeing and how, as immigration has become more people of color, the resistance has increased. We, look at, we can look at the uh, suicide rates among lesbian and gay teenagers, which are still four times greater than those among straight teenagers. So how can we look at that and without asking the question, you know, are we really being successful? Because if we look over the last 15 years, and we say historically, we say, well, there have been improvements in a lot of the things I'm talking about, but the curve generally looks like this. And that is it's leveling off. So how successful are we? I'd say not successful enough. And I think that the, the question we want to begin to ask ourselves is who are we being as an industry that's producing these results? I mean, it's one thing for us to look externally, and mostly we've been talking so far this morning about what things out there need to change. But what I want us to invite us to look at is, who are we being? See, if we look at the background of where this work has come from, it's generally existed in an us versus them background. Back in the days of civil rights, we had to break down doors with sledgehammers. You know, we created this sense that they were that and we were us, or those of us who allied with. Very much that them versus us that cultural phenomenon. And it's created this norm in our culture, which is a sort of a conversational network of contention. We see it today in politics. People come into the conversation with an already point of view. It's why we're so locked up, because we're not looking at the commonality to make a difference. And so that background shows up as sort of a good person, bad person phenomenon. You know what I mean. There are people like us who are the good people. We believe in tolerance and, you know, uh, we believe in diversity and we would never treat anybody any other way. And then there are the bad people do all that stuff we read about. It's created this sort of oppressor victim mindset. But the reality is that what we're learning today about the unconscious mind, and I just want to touch about it for a moment. I'm actually going to 10, 15, I'll be doing a whole hour and a half on this subject of the unconscious mind. You know, what we're learning is that all of us have common traits. So I want to give you an example of this. I want you to look at this picture for just a moment. And just see if you can see any discernible image in this picture. Just raise your hand if you see any clear discernible image. A handful of people around the room. Okay, now some of you may have seen the cow. You're wondering what cow. Here, I'll make it easier for you. Okay, now most of you now I'm sure can see the cow looking at you. Now I'm going to, after having seen it this way, I'm going to show you the picture again. Now how many people now can see the cow? Raise your hands. Okay, almost the whole room. Something that was invisible to us a minute ago. This is the way our minds organize. We organize our minds around the things that we know. We see the world differently from each other. And what science is now teaching us is that the world that we think that we see is only a function of our identity. It's a function of the way our brain has learned to see certain things and not other things. And inside that sort of victim, oppressor, good person, bad person model, we've seen certain patterns. So on one side, for those who are in non-dominant groups, or excuse me, in dominant groups, the access to power, privilege and entitlement. 
um, the se a sense of chauvinism, an objectification of the other, and also self-protection and defensiveness. This is the world that occurs for us. It's not that we choose to see it as much as our life experience has given us that world. On the other hand, for those who are in non-dominant groups or who are sometimes referred to as the victim groups, we see a striving for power. We see internalized oppression and stereotype threats. We see diminished internal expectations that come from that, but also an objectif objectification of the other and self-protection and defensiveness. And the currency that holds all of this together is fear. It's a fundamental currency that holds all of this together. So what I'm, what I'm calling is for us as diversity practitioners to look at what role we play in this. You see, this system is perfectly designed to produce the result that it's producing. And the way we know that is because it's producing that result. But see, who have we been when you think about it? You know, how often have we come into an organization with the righteous warrior attitude teaching them how to be, fixing them, and then surprised that we get resistance. How do we have to reinvent the way we see ourselves in our work if we're going to break through and create a new level of achievement in this system? You see, that's really what we've got to confront. The outer work of diversity professionals is something that we look at all the time. How much do we look at the inner work of ourselves? How much do we look at our own blind spots, our own biases? How much do we look at our own objectification of the other? How often do we come to corporate leaders expecting them not to want to work with us? Or being timid because we've already decided how they're going to be based on what they look like and who they are? How many times do we turn away allies because we don't trust them? The question that I'm calling to ask is do we want to be right about our point of view or do we want to be successful? Do we want to make a difference? You see, when we do our work only looking from the past to fix problems, what are we going to find but problems? And with those problems, pain and fear, justification of the otherness. When we look only from being convinced of our own righteousness and how right we are, how can we expect to find anything but resistance? How many of us want to be fixed? How does it feel when somebody comes to you and says, you know, let me fix you? And then we're surprised that people come into diversity training like this. When we look from the survival of our own ego, our own point of view, our attachment to that, what we find is separation from the other. However, when we look to the future, we find vision, and vision can pull us forward. And in our vision, we also have the possibility of creating a shared vision, a vision that other people can align with. When we look from our own vulnerability and, humil and humility and realize that we have our own biases, we have our own blind spots, we have our own assumptions that we make about people, that we're in this game with people, from that place we find compassion and connection. And not only our own compassion and connection, but the compassion and connection of others. When we look openly and honestly at ourselves, we find our common humanity with others. And only in that common humanity will we ultimately find success. Now, I know, you know a lot of times when I talk about this, uh, people say, well, this is naive. You know, we come from fighting across the ramparts. We come from you know, having to be at war. And we do, to some degree, always have to be warriors and always point out what's wrong, what's missing, and what needs to be fixed. But if that's the fundamental place we come from, we can also get stuck there. What I'm talking about is not naive. It's a kind of thinking that has transformed the world in numerous cases. You know, last, last week, Nelson Mandela lay in a hospital bed, and many people around the world feared for his life, this transcendent human being who we've had the extraordinary privilege of being on the planet with at the same time, a person who had more right to be angry and vindictive than any of us in this room had 27 years of his life ripped from him, stuck in a cell mostly by himself all that time. But something happened remarkable when Mandela came out. And Mandela explained it this way. He said, forget the past, forgive the past. Courageous people do not fear forgiving for the sake of peace. 
A good leader knows that at the end, he and the other side must be closer and thus emerge stronger. If you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy, and then he becomes your partner. And the only way we can do that, the only way we can truly meet people as partners in this quest we're on, is when we start by working on ourselves.